I want to I want to tell you about a outlaw and a villain who is buried here in Bledsoe County, who was uh, n known all over the United States as one of the one of the most famous outlaws ever uh, to live. He he was born in Middle Tennessee, Williamson County. His daddy was a Methodist preacher, and his mama took pride in teaching her children how to steal. Her third child became her favorite child, and that was John A. Merle. He was the third child out of eight. And he learned to steal very good from, from her, their neighbors or whoever he could steal from. And he would bring back stuff to the mama. <clears throat> if you're raised by a daddy that's a preacher and a mama that's teaching you how to steal, uh, I think that, that might mess your head up a little bit as a, as a young man. Uh, by the time John A. Merle was a older teenager and close to 20 years old, he was a, stealing horses. He was stealing anything he could get his hands on. And he had even got a, a band of some other guys uh, following him around. But when he was about 22 years of age, he, uh, he finally got caught stealing a horse and he was put in prison for a while. And while he was there, he was branded uh, H.T., on this end of his thumb, and that's horse thief. That was done a lot back then. If you caught stealing, you sometimes you got branded. When he got out of prison, instead of doing what he should be doing and doing the right things, he, he became even more of a of an outlaw. And he had a good following. And he he became famous by going down on the Natchez Trace. Now the Natchez Trace was a road 400 miles long from Natchez, Mississippi up to near Nashville, coming through the Mid-South and all the way down to Natchez. And a lot of people in the fall, they would take their crops, they would even take lumber and they would float down the Ohio and Mississippi River. And they'd go to New Orleans and then they would sell their goods and then they would travel by horse or buggy and they'd come back up to Natchez Trace. Well, they had their money where they'd sold their goods so John A. Merle and his gang, and other gangs, but his was the most famous, would, would hide out and, and rob them. And uh, if they had to kill them, they would kill them. Now, John A. Merle claimed that the day he died that he never killed anyone. But sometimes you can look at estimates and see him and his, <clears throat> his outlaws. There's estimates they, they killed maybe up to 400 people during their time. Uh, he, was, he was well known, and Mark Twain said that John A. Merle and uh, they said that Jesse James and his gang was nothing compared to John A. Merle and his band of outlaws. Mark Twain, one of the most famous authors ever, even in the book Adventures of Tom Sawyer, and many people has got this book. Here's one of the lines in there. It says, Twas always said that Merle's gang used around here one summer. Well, now, they talked with a little bit different language then. Used means they stayed around here. And this chapter here is talking about a, a box of gold they had dug up. So even Mark Twain knew who John A. Merle was, and, and, and most everybody did. Uh, after the uh, Nash's Trace, he, he was known, and this probably what got him known better than anything, as a, uh, for having slave rebellions. And him and his gang would go into these plantations, and they would give word out to the plantations that they were going to go in and save the, uh, you know, get them released and take them up north. Well, they, the word got around the plantation. And all these plantations had two or three hundred slaves. And they knew the night that was going to happen. And they'd be there and they, they would take off. And they would take off with the jump into the gang. And he would travel with them to maybe a hundred miles until they got far enough away that nobody knew what was going on. And he would resell them. And he did that a lot reselling the slaves. And finally, uh, he got <clears throat> caught. Merle and his gang, was Merle, they would go to a church, and John A. Merle knew his Bible very well. He would pose as a preacher. He would go in and preach a, preach a good sermon. And while he was preaching the sermon, his gang would be outside uh, stealing the horses or robbing stuff out of the wagons. And when church service was over, uh, the church members would come out and they horses would be gone or they'd had a lot of stuff stolen and by that time John A. Merle was gone and his gang they were taking off and, and going again. He finally did get convicted of 
uh, horse stealing and and or the slave rebellion too, and, and put in the Tennessee Penitentiary in, in 1834. And during that time, it is told that tickets were sold for people to pay to get in just to look at John A. Merle. And I don't know my, how that made him feel, probably not too good, but he, toward the end, he was in for about nearly a little over nine years. And in 1844, he was in very bad health with what we now call tuberculosis, and he was released from prison. He made his way by stagecoach to Sparta, Tennessee, and then he made his way across the Cumberland Plateau, and he stopped out and worked for a blacksmith shop, a man by the name of Norwood, out uh, near Braden Knob on what's now in Fall Creek Falls State Park, and he worked there shortly, and then he made his way on down to Pyeville, where he was befriended by, by many of the citizens of Pyeville, a lot of them well-known citizens of Pyeville, and uh, Pyeville was a pretty prosperous, prosperous place in the 1840s. Uh, anything you needed, you could get here. Uh, one man was named Scott Terry. He befriended him. Uh, and also, uh, there was a carpenter here by the name of A.P. Green. And uh, we'll mention him again in just a minute. He didn't live too long. He was uh, a man that lived up the valley by the name of John Billingsley, who had a big plantation. He really took him under his wing, and, and maybe he even lived up there with him some. I don't know that for a fact. I think maybe he lived in Pyeville. But he didn't live for about six months, and then he passed away. And when he passed away, the town, the prominent citizen of Pyeville, some of the men got his body, and they prepared his body. And, and there was the carpenter, a real good carpenter, A.P. Green, and he built a casket for him. And just the finest casket you would find and put a lining in it, and when he got it finished with all the guys standing around, he jumped in that casket and laid down and looked up and then just laid there a minute and jumped out and laughed and told the guys, he said, I've done something no other, no other man in the world can ever say he did. He said, I laid in John A. Merle's casket. And they took him and gave him a proper burial in a cemetery up the valley. And it's a few days later, one night, uh, apparently somebody came and robbed his uh robbed the grave dug him up cut his head off and took the, took the head and left the body just laying there in a pile of dirt that next morning two of the slaves on this plantation they got up and they was walking through the field and they looked up on the field and they seen something unusual and when they got up there they seen what had happened and they ran back to the uh, billingsley house and and told them somebody's done the Mr. Merle up and cut his head off. Well, this infuriated Mr. Billingsley. And of course, he wanted to find out who did it. Uh, a story told by Miss Robinette, who is a county historian here in Pyeville, and she did a lot of research. She thinks a doctor in Marion County, Tennessee, sent some people up here, two men, at nighttime to dig his grave up. And after they got it dug up, uh, early the next morning, they went across probably 40 the river and wound up over in the Cold Springs community. Their buggy or their wagon was having a problem, so they stopped at a, a shopsmith there and a blacksmith shop and was having it repaired. And then the blacksmith owner told them, told people later that there was a lot of flies and they had a, something covered up and a bad smell, but he said he didn't want to ask anything. So uh, he got it fixed. It was later in the afternoon and they made it down to Pipeville and they stayed in the Pipeville Hotel that night. Word had got around after that night that some of the people thought maybe these two guys was uh, some of the people who, you know, these ones who maybe had dug his head up. And they got word to Mr. Billingsley, but before he could get there the next morning, they were gone, and John A. Merle's head had left Bledsoe County never, never to be seen again. Uh, uh, one side story on that, Miss Robinette's mother, Miss Addie Robinette, who lived to be over 100, when she was little, she lived uh, up the valley north of Pipewell, and there was a, a a black gentleman who at one time was a was a slave. And this story would be told a lot about them robbing. And it, it, she was there a couple of times when the story is told, and she said that black man would always laugh. And there were many in the community that thought maybe he might have been the one that helped these guys when they come up to find to tell him what, because you just didn't come up at night in 1840 something and go up and rob, uh, you know, you had to know the road to get in, how to get out of it, where everything was, and somebody had never been here before, they couldn't have done that. They had to have some local help. And a lot of people speculated 
maybe he did it for some money and, and that he might have, and who knows, that'll never be, that'll never be found out who it was. But, uh, <clears throat> actor, the, a lot of stories about the head after it was dug up and cut off. A lot of people say it was taken around, sh showed at different places, but I don't think there's any documentation of that. There's one story, Vanderbilt University wanted it, but the Vanderbilt University didn't exist in 1844, so that story's not true. So that's kind of the legend of John A. Murrow.